Yes, I work on the Better Understanding the Metaphysics of Pregnancy project at Southampton. Um, so my, my background is in philosophy of biology, um, and then more recently, uh, partly influenced by Alexander, I suppose, uh, towards philosophy of medicine. <coughs> and, uh, well, I'm, I'm, okay, so apologies to Alexander, I'm so this is a longer version of a talk that Alexander's already heard. Um, and also apologies to Alexander, it seems like I'm permanently going to be able to make the same joke. Uh, I have to acknowledge the funding of the European Research Council, and there's a kind of there's an irony that what, we're, what the project's interesting is parts fusing and breaking apart. And, uh, so you can you can put your own joke in for that. And um, oh, so I'm I'm, uh, I'm happy to be interrupted if you want to ask any clarificatory questions. <coughs> so my aim is to apply. Uh, evolutionary accounts from the philosophy of biology and an immunological account from the philosophy of biology, uh, accounts of what it is to be a biological individual. So the case, the case that our project takes to be under, under explored the case of pregnancy. And uh, I'm interested, I might sometimes say we, um, I'm interested in so mammalian pregnancy, placental pregnancy, possibly um, we might see different things about different kinds of placenta. So hemochorial placentas are the most invasive placentas. So those are the ones that humans have. Um, other primates, but also rabbits and bats and other mammals. Uh, so some of the things that I say might be more tricky. It might be more tricky to make this case for some other kinds of placentas. There's a huge diversity of placental structures across uh, mammals. I'm going to conclude that the evolutionary account suggests that there are two individuals, two biological individuals during pregnancy, and that the, an immunological account, a recent uh, influential one uh, from Thomas Prader, suggests that there's one individual. I think that's a more tentative conclusion. Um, so I'm not really aiming today to try to um, Adjudicate about which one of these approaches is the right approach to take. Some some people, some people are hardcore evolutionists, evolutionary approach people when it comes to deciding what counts as an organism or a biological individual. I don't really want to adjudicate on that. I'm just interested in applying these theories to the case of pregnancy, which hasn't been done uh, in the past. Although I'll say a few things about the approaches because I think the, the case does shed some light on those on those approaches. And. I'm following people like Peter Godfrey Smith and Ellen Clark in talking about biological individuals. But I would, would, would want to say organisms. Uh, almost all of the time that I'm saying biological individual, he would say I'm talking about organisms. Um, and they might come, it might come up in questions, so there's, there are arguments about what's the right terminology, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with the Clark terminology and talk about biological individuals, but if you want to uh, just hear organ, organism every time I say that, then there, there's not going to be too much problem. I'm not going to get into debates about whether or not um, they're synonymous with each other. And so the claim is that we have what Clark has called a problem of individuality, and one that's much closer to home than the kinds of problems that people, problem cases that people have talked about in the past. I'll, I'll talk about some of those. Oh, I, so I, I don't like this phrase, trigger warning, but um, I don't have any sort of some slides, but pregnancy is the kind of topic where some people might have sort of sensitivities about various issues. Um, I don't think I'm going to say anything too uncomfortable for anybody. But I just haven't mentioned that it's the kind of topic that does arouse sensitivities in some people. Um, and so I'm going to start off by uh, going through some of the more general problem of biological individuality, because I'm assuming that, I that there aren't, well, certainly not a whole of an audience full of philosophers of biology. So I'm going to talk about philosophy, biology, literature on individuality, biological individuality, and then I'm going to talk about applying those approaches to, uh, and then I'm going to talk about specific approaches, the evolutionary approach and the immunological approach, and then I'll apply them to pregnancy. And Elsalane Kingler, who's the, so I'm going to be criticising some of Elsalane's work, some of her claims here. Uh, she's in charge of the Bump project. Um, so she's got a forthcoming paper in mind where she appeals to some of the criteria of individuality in the philosophy of biology literature 
to support what she wants to say as a part whole claim about the gestator fetus relation. And she does that on the basis that the, gesta the gestator alone and the fetus alone don't possess various suggested criteria of individuality, but that the gestator fetus whole does possess some of those features. Uh, and she, she contrasts that model with what she would call a mere containment model of pregnancy, where, um, so one of the, one of the um, analogies that's out in the literature is where the, the gestator is, um, is a fridge with a tub of yogurt in it, where the, the fetus is the tub of yogurt that's kind of sitting in the fridge. So a, a, a different version of having a bun in the oven. In fact, an even more passive version than having a bun in the oven. Oh, and I should have said, sorry, I should have said, I missed that about, okay, so um, terminology. I'm gonna talk about gestators and fetuses. Although some of what I'm talking about, technically, it's, it won't be a fetus, it might be a blastocyst at the stage of pregnancy that I'm talking about. But I'm just going to use fetus as a general term. I'm going to use gestator just to emphasise that we're not just interested in humans. Although in the background of the project, of course, there is an interest in applying conclusions from this work to humans. But I want to be neutral about that, really. So I'll talk about gestator and fetus. Oh, and um, so I'm not going to say very much about this. This is really just to illustrate the the fact that the Elsalane's interest in setting up the Bunt project and in arguing for this part or claim is that uh, she, she wants to she wants to develop a metaphysics of pregnancy that takes the biology biology of pregnancy seriously and looks at the details of the biology of pregnancy. Um, so her her part or claims a lot of that is based on the uh, the very great degree of interpenetration between the fetus and the just data uh, via the placenta. So in a way, so this is just post-implantation of the fertilized egg, um, or the blastocyst actually. Uh, in a way, the most important kind of the most important thing from these diagrams is just to emphasize that this isn't the uh, this isn't the uterus. This is the uterus down here. This is the uterine wall with the implanted embryo inside the uterine wall, where. Um, previous figure would have shown the plug which gradually closes over after implantation where the, uh, after the blastocyst has penetrated the uh, uterine wall. So I think it's interested in taking this kind of uh, interpenetration seriously. I'm not going to say, I won't say very much any, any more about that at the moment, about that slide. Okay, so going back to Elson's claim, I want to argue that um, Many of the criteria that she rests her claims on to do with the, this part whole claim are ones that have been criticised, as we'll see, for being not very good defining criteria of what it is to be a biological individual. Um, but having said that, I'm just interested today in talking about the, what I'm going to call the counting question of how many biological individuals there are, and setting aside part whole neurological issues as something to think about once the counting question has been settled. You, you might well think it might come up in crisis. You might think that these are going to be set tightly interlocked in a way that means you can't really kind of tease them apart. Just think about one and then worry about the other. But the aim today is just to think about counting individuals, counting organisms. <coughs> so, uh, so this is the philosophy of biology, biology literature. Well, Clark, I'm about to actually the, that's the title of a 2010 paper. Problem of biological individuality. So on the face of it, there isn't a problem here. Uh, these are there are lots of individual aspen trees here, lots of dandelion plants, a group of aphids, a group of individual aphids, and uh, lots of bees. Honey bees. And Philosophers of biology and theoretical biologists have suggested various criteria as being defining necessary and sufficient criteria for something to count as a single biological individual. Uh, the theoretical biologists tend not to use, they tend not always to be clear about whether they're making claims about necessity or sufficiency, but there are lots and lots of candidates. So one possibility is that what it is to be, we can find the, 
we can find biological individuals by finding the unique chunks of genetic homogeneity, biological material that's genetically homogenous. So that's one possibility. Uh, another is people, sometimes people just talk about life cycles, but sometimes there's an emphasis on sexual recombination, sexual reproduction. So sexual reproduction marks a starting point, death, death marks an end point, or a new um, a new sexual recombination event is another starting point of another individual. So sex is sometimes suggested. People will em emphasize um, contiguities or topological considerations, spatial boundaries and uh, contiguity. Policing is something that comes up, and I'll come back, I'll come back to policing when I talk about the evolutionary approach, Park's evolutionary approach. So people will talk about the way in which um, and colonies police by workers throwing out eggs which have been laid by um, other workers as opposed to the queen. For, for, for a long time it was thought that it was um, only queens that laid eggs and gradually it's come to be biologists to recognise that other ants in a colony can and sometimes do lay eggs but they're policed by other workers because they're thrown out so they don't survive. And that's often called policing. Femiosis, uh, people would, uh, that's another policing mechanism. So the femiosis Thermiosis is the way in which there's a random coin flip to determine which of the two alleles I've inherited from my parents goes into <coughs> the next generation, goes into my offspring. Germosoma differentiation is another suggestion. So, on that suggestion, organisms or biological individuals are the chunks of biological material where there's a division of reproductive labour between germ cells and somatic cells, which don't go in for reproduction. And another suggestion, so these, some of these are going to be more important than others later on, another suggestion is that uh, to find the organisms, we need to find the single cell bottlenecks. So if we go through single cell bottlenecks, we've got a single fertilized egg, so there's large chunks of biological material, but when, there, when there's a new individual, that's where we've gone through some very tight bottleneck of an individual cell. And then there are, so Clark Ellen's paper has got, um, well, sometimes she, she talks about that being, sometimes she talks about 13, and sometimes she talks about 20 odd candidates, depending on how fine grained you want to distinguish between them. But there are lots of candidates. Yeah. This is just a quick question. Could you say, yeah. could you give an example of you know, how this might, these criteria play out? So you mentioned the policing, yeah. and it wasn't clear to me how that yeah. fed more on. Well, I mean, I can sort of guess, but yeah, yes. it's not immediately obvious. That's yeah. almost how that might might bear yeah, so on the issue of yeah. one individual or two or many. Or so I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna end up flicking back to the picture rather than having a new copy of the picture. Yeah. So um, so we can. So in Clark's paper, she she basically goes through a big kind of table where she's got she's got various candidates, various things, and then eight or so different different accounts of biological individuality, and then she's got a kind of six by eight table of applying each criterion to various candidate organisms, and then sort of ticking off. I'm not going to try to do that, but I am going to talk about the way in which all of these can be seen as problematic. So, um, so I could start, well, so first I'll just put up another picture, because um, people have typically, so Clark uses the example of a puppy. I'm not quite sure, I need to ask her whether or not I don't think she chose a puppy deliberately because she was thinking that pregnancy might be interesting and she wanted to rule out the possibility that it was a pregnant dog, I'm not sure. Uh, but uh, until recently people have talked about um, mammals and other higher metazoans being fairly relatively unproblematic, I mean, we know what the individuals. An oak tree, a gorilla, and that's a Portuguese man of war, the siphonophore. So these are meant to be relatively unproblematic. And now to talk about the problem. Okay, so <coughs> what, 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 what Clark's conclusion is, and I think it's a strong one, is that none of these criteria are going to kind of latch on to exactly where we think the biological individuals are. So in some cases, things will be ticked off as being biological individuals when we think that they shouldn't be. And in other cases, they won't be ticked off according to the criteria when we think they should be. And so when, when she produces this big table that I'm not going to she thinks that she's shown that there's no single criterion that's unproblematic. For instance, genetic homogeneity is problematic because oak trees, for instance, don't have it. Uh, lots of plants don't have it, but by the time an oak tree's uh, 
been alive for hundreds of years, there'll be quite a lot of genetic variation between one side of the tree and the other due to mutations. So the aliens on different sides won't be genetically homogenous. So there's, uh, and I'll talk a bit more later on actually about the way in which we're not genetically homogenous. Uh, it's also problematic because typically people take that Portuguese man of war to not be an individual. It looks like a jellyfish, but in the biological literature it's typically taken to be a colony of zooids. Um, so the, the sort of received biological wisdom, the received biological uh, science wisdom is that it's a colony, but it, it does have genetic homogeneity because it does grow from a single cell. But the, uh, so Clark thinks actually that maybe the, maybe there's good reason to reclassify the Portuguese man of war as a single biological individual, like true jellyfish. Um, but there are, there are technical reasons why people think that it should be classified as a colony rather than as a single organism. Sexual reproduction, that doesn't seem like, a, that seems like really a non-starter given that there's all sorts of asexual reproduction in the world. So, um, dandelions, can undergo um, apomixis, which is where so the, the seeds will spread, but the seeds are unfertilized, but they're viable. So it's likely, it's likely that, of course, this links up with genetic, genetic homogeneity, sorry. So it's likely that they're all clones of each other, because it's fairly rare that they do sexual reproduction. Uh, the aphids as well undergo parthenogenesis, so they re they reproduce asexually. So there are arguments for saying that reproduction of aphids is merely growth, that there's only one aphid, or there's one biological individual, but it's just it's housed in multiple aphids. Uh, aphids get even more complicated because there are um, obligate parasites which are passed through vertical transmission to the next generation. Um, and on some accounts, the aphids are going to come out as being, well, the individual is going to come out as being not just the aphid, but also the, the, um, the uh, microbes, which are, did I say parasites? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, sorry, that was wrong. Okay, so they're not parasites, they're, they're microbes which are essential for the functioning of the aphid. So it's a mutualism where the aphids rely on the parasites, and the parasites can't live without the aphids, and the parasite microbes, the microbes rely on the aphids and the aphids rely on the microbes and the microbes are passed on vertically um, and so Clark tends to think that that means that the microbes should be considered as part of the aphids. So again, so is this reproduction of dandelions or is it just growth even when it's different dandelion patches that are, might be separated by miles or hundreds and hundreds of meters where seeds are blown? Um, Spatial boundaries, um, so the aspen grove may not have spatial boundaries. Uh, the point of the aspen grove is that um, there's a great deal of genetic homogeneity between the aspen, so the, the way that they grow is similar to things like so bamboo or uh, buttercups and so on. So they send out runners and then new trees uh, pop up. So new trees pop up, but um, they're all coming from a, a single, what's called a single uh, genet. So these are these these can be referred to as rabbits, and there's one genetic individual, a genet, and it's just throwing up these things. But of course, over hundreds of years, it might be that through um, erosion and so on, that the connections between these trees have been lost. So now there's, now there's the sort of spatial separateness that makes them look like individuals, but of the genetic considerations kind of pull against that. Oh, the bee colony. So what makes the bee colony tricky is that the bee colony seems to do this germ soma division of labour. So that where, where, but the analogy is with the worker bees being the somatic cells and the queen being the germ cell, as it were. So there's that, there's that kind of division of labour that people have emphasised as being important when it comes to biological individuality. And so aspen don't have it, or don't have it very much. Uh, plants might have some sort of differentiation. Um, most, most plants don't go through a single cell bottleneck, so those, those uh, the runners that the aspen give out 
are nowhere near being single cell bottlenecks. They're bottlenecks, a little, there's a little bit of bottlenecking because there's only some cells go through, but it's not a single, so it's nowhere near a single cell bottleneck. So the conclusion is that none of these are unproblematic? So I don't, I don't know if that answers your question, Alexander. You didn't mention the free thing, that's one you didn't. Right, so. Oh, well, I want to come, yeah, I want to come back to releasing later. Okay. Uh, yeah. I mean, but certainly, certainly, I mean, workaround policing doesn't occur everywhere. So these, these individual mechanisms, what I'm going to call mechanisms later, don't occur ubiquitously. But as we'll see, Clark wants to say that policing in a more general sense is crucial. So I'll come back to policing. So that's what makes sense. So, um, so as I say, so I think, so my aim though is to just give a sense of the fact that this, this is, it's problematic, it's not obvious what the right criteria are. And now I'm going to talk about two suggestions. After I've just noted that, I, so I don't know if anyone knows this literature on holobionts. So, I don't know how many years ago. So, well, ten, eight years ago when Clark's writing, she just takes it for granted that uh, we are straightforward and mammals are straightforward. But there's more and more understanding now the way in which we rely on our gut flora in order to survive. Or to, we, we die very quickly without it. And uh, some biologists and some philosophers of biology want to argue that the gut flora should be counted as part of part of an individual, well, not human organism, not homo sapien, a holobiont is the, the term that was coined. Uh, so it'd be nice to be able to say that pregnancy is the kind of unique, special example of where there's something problematic when it comes to humans. But given that there's this micro microbiota um, phenomenon, like we, we can't claim that. We can't claim that. And there's a lot. There's a lot of parallel between some of the things I'll say about pregnancy and some of the literature on microbiomes. How <coughs> quickly do we get that? I mean, so, so you, 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 I, there are you know, scientists experiment with micro-free mice, and yes. they, I mean they're not happy. They yeah. they're, but they're not fed. No, I think, okay, yeah, I may have misspoken in there. Um, um, so we certainly didn't want to lose our microbiomes. We haven't, we haven't, but we're, we're, not, we're not sort of, you're walking. Yeah, so, so the experimental evidence isn't in humans right. so much. And I should say, uh, we, we have reduced fitness. Oh yeah, we certainly would. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, so yeah, thank you. I, yeah, I, so I think that's an exaggeration. Although, I mean, I think the evidence is all, the evidence is kind of consistently moving in the direction of the biome oh, being kind of more and more important. So every every year or whatever, the the holobiome that, that was that was coined much longer ago than say eight years. I can't remember when it was coined, but at the time when it was coined, it was a kind of really wacky idea, and it's only getting more it's only getting more seriously taken. And so I would say that Kingma Elsalin, um I think she tends to focus on some of the criteria that Clark tends to undermine. Now, I've done a little bit of that undermining. So, for instance, I think Arsene tends to emphasise the contiguity and topological uh, idea of an organism, and that's one of the ones that King, uh, that's one of the ones that Clark and other people have undermined as being important. But having said that, for instance, the fact that Clark and others have emphasised that genetic homogeneity shouldn't be a requirement that that helps. Kingless kind of cause, as it were, because the fact that the fetus gestator whole are not genetically homogenous isn't immediate, doesn't immediately make it a non starter because we've already kind of thrown out the genetic homogeneity as a, as a definition. So, <clears throat> so that's me trying to quickly kind of explain why we even need to worry about what counts as an individual. And now I'm going to talk about the positive suggestions from uh, Clark and Peter Godfrey Smith, and then I'll do the immunological one. So both these authors are very clear that their, their emphasis is on evolutionary considerations, natural selection considerations for deciding what's an individual. So for Clark, individuals, biological individuals, are entities that can act as targets of a natural selection process, and a natural selection process requires heritable variation of fitness. These fitness differences that are heritable. And so she thinks, her, her claim is that all of those all those mechanisms, that are what she's going to call mechanisms, all those criteria are different. There are, there are a plurality of ways of uh, realizing these two functional roles that she thinks are the defining features. OK? 
Okay, so for her, in order for something to be an individual, there needs to be suppression of intra-individual fitness differences uh, via what she calls, unsurprisingly, policing mechanisms. So she's using that term. Um, so the idea is that there, there's policing, which means that there's suppression of fitness variation within the entity, and also demarc what she calls a demarcation, which uh, allows there to be variation in fitness between individuals, rather than more having the same fitness between individuals. And so she thinks that various mechanisms can play that role. So for instance, physical boundaries can do both. Because if we're topologically and if we're topologically linked and if we've got a membrane around us, that tends to align the fitness of the particles, as it were, the stuff that's inside the membrane, because there's a shared environment. And it also tends to allow there to be differences in fitness between individuals because they've got dif they've got different membranes, as it were. So some of them can play about uh, two roles. Uh, germ cell receptor specialization. So that the idea is that was a good candidate because it's a policing mechanism. Um, all my somatic cells are, as it were, in the same boat, which is governed by my germ cells. My somatic cells can't reproduce. There's no point in them trying to reproduce. If I get cancer because of runaway cell proliferation, I just die. Um, a nice illustration of that really is, um, so there's a, there's a facial cancer in Tasmanian devils, which is, a, which is a, it's the, it's the Tasmanian devil's cells itself which are proliferating, but it's transmissible. Those somatic cells can jump across to other Tasmanian devils, and that's a, sort of a hideously virulent disease, which is kind of rampaging through, threatening to wipe out the Tasmanian devil population. And that's a case of the germ soma specialization being subverted by some somatic cells that are able to kind of get out. Some, they're able to make their, their own way into another generation rather than just rely on uh, germ cells, sperm or egg cells, gametes. So various mechanisms can play a part in realising these roles, but none of the realising mechanisms on their own are necessary or sufficient. What matters is, what's necessary and sufficient is that there are sufficiently good realisers of each functional role, and if you've got something that plays that functional role, and it might be a different mechanism in different organisms, then you've got one biological individual. But, and this is important for the, what I'm going to say now, some of these realizers seem to typically be much more effective than others. So for instance, a single cell bottleneck, one of the candidates, is an extremely good policing mechanism because we go through a single cell bottleneck, all of our, all of our cells, it's a, there's, a, there's a caveat that this isn't strictly speaking true, but all of our cells are clones of each other. I mean, so there are going to be mutations, but, our, but, uh, but when we go through the bottleneck, we just then our cells proliferate, and we're just, a, we're just a sea of cloned cells with the same genetic material, so there can't be fitness differences. Um, so a single cell bottleneck is an extremely effective policing mechanism, and sexual recombination is an extremely effective demarcation mechanism. So sexual recombination produces distinct, uh, well, distinct individuals, distinct entities that can have different fitnesses. There's lots, of, there's, there's lots of theoretical biology discussion about why sex arose, and one of, one of the candidate answers, or kind of the core of the candidate answer, is that it's a variation producing mechanism. So that's Clark. Now I'm just going to say a bit about Godfrey Smith, but it's going to be quite similar, and then we're going to apply both of those to pregnancy. How much time have we got? Okay, so I'm going to talk for a minute. So Godfrey Smith, he doesn't quite build his account around Clark's functional roles, and anyway, he comes first chronologically. Um, his focus is on, what, is on what Clark takes to be the most effective policing mechanisms. He tends to emphasize policing. And so, <coughs> so this fits, Godfrey Smith really, one, way, one reason to introduce him is, to, is that he's, he emphasizes some of those mechanisms that I emphasised as being really important realisers of Clark's functional roles. So for him, the crucial things for being a biological individual are the degree to which you go through a single cell bottleneck, the degree to which you have germ soma specialisation, and the degree to which you're an, you're an integrated entity. So he has this space. Uh, so this is increasing bottlenecking. So, the, so this axis is, getting, is a smaller and smaller bottleneck. 
this is more and more germ soma specialization, and this is more and more integration. So he thinks that there can be variation, but we, another paradigmatic individual, sit up in this volume near 111, whereas um, Aspen have got lots of integration. The individual Aspen trunk, the rabbit, has got a lot of integration, he's going to say, but it doesn't go through a tight bottleneck, it doesn't have very clear germ soma separation, and so on. So and buffalo herds come out as being totally marginal cases, and various other, um, various other biological entities take up different intermediate places in this space, but the paradigmatic individuals are things like us and mammals, and we sit up here. As I said, to, to say that is for Gobby Smith to put us there is to, to ignore this gradually developing literature since then on biomes. But that's his suggestion. Uh, and these are the bulbousing algae. Maybe I won't say too much about those because I think I talk quite a lot about it. Uh, I should get onto pregnancy. Um, but these are various kinds of algae, uh, various species that go from being kind of completely free living individuals to being highly specialised uh, organisms with a lot of division of labour of different parts. Uh, so that ball, that's just a company, that's just a ball of algae cells that stick together, and that's uh, gunium, and that's so that's one of Godfrey Smith's examples here. So they do go through a bottleneck, but they're not very integrated. And they don't have germ soma differentiation. All of those, all of that, that little sticky bundle of cells, they can all just reproduce willy nilly separately. Uh, whereas uh, cartery is kind of gets us closer, and that is that's E. So here we're starting to have germ soma separation, and by F, that's going to be up towards the sort of paradigmatic individual. So people often use this, these forms in algae as a kind of, you can almost have a kind of snapshot of a transition from individual, collective of individuals to one organism, multicellular organism. Okay, Godfrey Smith, so he says, he says integration's hard to define. Uh, he says it's a summary of such features as the extent of division of labor, mutual dependence of parts, maintenance of a boundary. Um, I'll come back to integration. But now I want to apply this to pregnancy. So we, we reach pregnancy. So I would say that it's clear that uh, the gestation of the fetus are on either side of a single cell bottleneck event. Um, the fertilized egg is the single cell bottleneck. And so they're on either side of it. And so it seems so. So uh, I'm talking about Clark now. If a single cell bottleneck is an extremely good policing mechanism, then we've got we've got a kind of paradigmatic case of a of a policing mechanism there. We've also got germ soma, which I'll come to in a minute. Uh, and we're, and the fetus and the gestator are also at either side of a sexual recombination event, because we're, we're talking about mammals. Um, so all of these organisms are undergoing uh, sexual. Reproduction, so there's sperm and eggs, and we've got a new combination of genes. So, I should say for those people who know about this stuff, um, that's not to deny the possibility that there can be intra intragenomic conflict within me, but it's, ex it's damped down to a great degree by the bottlenecking, and variation between individuals is allowed by recomb sexual recombination. So I would say that Clark's two realizers, there are really, really good realizers of both functional roles in place, so we've got two evolutionary individuals. There's a bit of a compl com complication here, um, because the, the fetus's survival contributes to its own fitness, but it, and it also contributes to the gestator's fitness. But nevertheless, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say that it's clear that the, the gestator fitness and the fetal fitness are distinct from each other, they're not the same thing. Uh, we can think about cases where the gestator might have a very high, the gestator might have a high expected fitness on the basis that, that it's, uh, or she is extremely uh, 
fecund and is able to produce lots of offspring, offspring has high fertility, but any, any particular fetus might have very low expected fitness because it, it, it happens to be a, a fetus might have, it might have zero viability, it might even reach full term, but that wouldn't, it's consistent with the fetus having zero expected fitness, that the gestator still has relatively high expected fitness, and vice versa. There could be a gestator who didn't have very high expected fitness because she, because she's not very fertile, but any individual fetus might have very high expected fitness because it might be, it might have you know, a whole suite of traits that are really really uh, useful to it as it were. There's there's an extra complication because of course the fetal survival and maternal survival actually mutually affect each other because if the fetus dies, that will have an effect on that will raise the chance that the gestator dies and vice versa. But nevertheless, I want to insist that the, the two fitnesses are distinct from each other. Okay, Godfrey Smith. So, um, as I said, the analysis is going, to, is going to be similar. We've gone through a bottleneck, or the gestation and fetus are on either side of the bottleneck, so bottlenecking is there to a high degree. There's germ soma specialization in the fetus and germ soma specialization in the gestator. They have their own germ soma specialization. Um, but as it happens, cells start to be laid down according to functional role, even by about week three. Female germ cells are present in humans at birth. Integration, though, when I apply Godfrey Smith, I find it more difficult to apply integration. Um, it seems to cut across Clark's demarcation and policing mechanisms. Um, it seems that the gestator is highly in integrated. If we just take the female, for whatever species it is, for any species it is, there's this high integration that we would take the we would take a non-pregnant uh, non individual to have. But the fetus seems to have various features of integration, that kind of lack of autonomy of bits of the fetus, um, a division of labor of different functions within the fetus. But having said that, the gestator fetus does appear, and this is kind of King was argument, that it does appear to have lots of features of integration. I mean, I, so I think that's interesting, because if, if we think that the, 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 the gestator fetus doesn't have bottlenecking, it doesn't have germ soma, but it does have lots of integration, that actually puts it in a place on Godfrey Smith's diagram where there isn't anything. So it puts it in this zero, zero, one place of lots of integration, but none of the other features. And that's not something, which is not one of his examples. So I take that to be an interesting possibility, but I'm not particularly arguing for it. But I think Alceline would, she would want to emphasize the integration of the gestator fetus whole. You might think that integration at the higher level of the gestator fetus, the fact that that's, there's a lot of integration there across the placenta, that that in some sense undermines the, 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 the sense that there's integration at the lower level of the gestator and the fetus alone. But I don't think that's right, because for instance, we don't let the fact that um, we don't let the fact that organisms have a very high level of integration make that doesn't lead us to think that there's a, that the integration that you have at the cellular level is in some sense illusory. We're, we're, we're happy for there to be a high degree of, we're happy to think of a high degree of integration at two levels simultaneously. And one integration at one level doesn't seem to undermine our sense that there's integration at the at the other level. But again, I'm not. If you think. If we think that integration at the higher level of the gestator fetus is undermining the sense of the integration at the lower level, that gets us 110 on Godfrey Smith's diagram. So, which is another unoccupied position where there's bottlenecking in germ soma differentiation but not very much in, less integration. So, it kind of puts us with Volvox, Carteri, and or, or into this unoccupied area. Again, I'm not really, I'm not arguing for that, but. There's an argument that could be made that there's lack of integration. But I tend to think, and this is why I'm making the comment about these, these theories, I think really this suggests that Godfrey Smith's integration criterion is it's just packing too many things into it. It's not easy to adjudicate, or it's not easy to apply the theory. That might be seen as being an argument in favour of um, the Clark approach. <coughs> My conclusion is that in either of these approaches, we, could, we get the answer that there are two individuals. Okay? 
Godfrey Smith's integration seems to push us towards physiology, and that's what I'm going to talk about now, because now I'm going to talk about a different approach to biological individuality, which is immunological individuality. <coughs> and this isn't the third. So I should, I should finish just about anything now. So Thomas Prudhoe has, uh, well, in fact, well, so he got awarded the Lakatosh Prize for Philosophy of Science over at the LSE. Um, this time last year. His book, The Limits of the Self, Immunology and Biological Identity, uh, puts forward an immunological approach to biological individuality. Although, no, you can go, so there's a, a symposium that we had at the Philosophy of Science Association a few weeks ago. We had a speaker, Moira Howes, and she was writing about immunology and the self. Well, that's 20, so 20 years ago now. So he's not the first person who made this suggestion, but it's a, it's a well developed recent account that that's proving influential. So he wants to say that there, he wants, he wants that to be a physiological definition of what it is to be an individual. And the immune system is what is, it, he thinks that, it, he thinks that there are good arguments for thinking that it's immune systems which are the kind of, the, they're the all pervasive feature in two senses actually. They're all pervasive in the sense that an immune system perfuses the whole of the biological material that we should think of as one individual. And it's also um, all pervasive because he argues that recent biological work over, over recent decades has given uh, more reason to think that you find immune systems across all taxa in the biological world. People had thought that immune systems were fairly restrict restricted to only certain taxa. And Prado wants to say, well, no, we can find kind of analogs, tight analogs of immune systems that go across all of the natural world right across to, or down to bacteria, for instance. That's, now that's a bit controversial, but I'm just going to apply his theory. <coughs> so he thinks biological individuals are the entities whose boundaries and cohesiveness are marked out by what's tolerated and what's not tolerated. And any, interaction, any entity which interacts regularly with the immune system is not eliminated by it, is part of that physiological individual. This is where you might think that I just can't avoid talking about parts and wholes. I said I didn't want to, but in, in this approach, it seems like I'm proposing to be using that language a lot. So that's, uh, so that's what he takes an immunological individual to be. And now I'll, I'll just apply it straight away. This is what I'm going to say that, um, so I'm going to spend less time on the immune stuff rather than the evolution stuff. So we'll just jump straight to immune tolerance in pregnancy. So mechanisms of tolerance begin within a few days of fertilization. Uh, well, actually, did I say within 24 to 48 hours of the beginning of implantation? So I think, that, I think if anything, that's wrong, and that immune mechanisms of tolerance begin even before implantation, right, right at implantation. Um, so a few days after fertilization, within just a very few days after fertilization. In fact, um, so the, the, the early pregnancy tests that you can take uh, detect, I think, what's called early pregnancy factor, and what they're detecting is immune, uh, immunological material in the mother. Um, so it's very early. That's the earliest pregnancy test you can get. <coughs> Various people have documented, again, this is relatively recent, so relatively recent work have uh, documented the way in which these immune the immune reactions between the fetus and mother are bidirectional. So, uh, so in the placenta, fetal tissue is, as it were, presented to maternal blood and vice versa. So it's bidirectional. This is a quote from a... Uh, so this is an immunology textbook. So it says the fetus, so this is a little section on fetal immune fetal tolerance, maternal fetal tolerance. The fetus is tolerated for two reasons. It occupies a site protected by non-immunogenic tissue barriers, and it promotes a local immunosuppressive response in the mother. Several sites in the body, such as the eye, so the cornea particularly, have these characteristics, and they allow prolonged acceptance of foreign tissue graft, so you can graft a cornea into someone and it won't get rejected very easily. Uh, they are usually called immunologically privileged sites. So I, I, I quote that just to emphasize the way in which the fetus is being characterized as a part of the 
mother in, this, in, a, in an analogous way to bits of the eye that are characterized as part of the mother. And it's, uh, yes. And over time, the emphasis is moving more and more away from the fetus being protected by a non immunogenic tissue barrier to a kind of to active immune suppression by the mother and by the fetus. Mutual immune suppression. So I'll just illustrate that by talking about microchimerism. So the placenta is not a tissue barrier. It's not a tissue barrier. So um, that's a quote from this figure from Bodhi et al. in 2015. Some of this is theoretical, actually. I think the so the blue cells are offspring cells, the first child cells, or purple ones, um, and. Uh, No, sorry. The orange dots are offspring one's cells, and purple dots are maternal cells, and green dots are offspring two cells. The theoretical bit is that it's not been demonstrated, I think, in humans that the second offspring can have cells in them which, can, which are cells which derive, are derived from the first offspring. Um, and I'm not sure that that's, I, that that's been de de um, I'm not sure that's been demonstrated in mice either. But um, what has been widely demonstrated in humans and in mice even more so is the finding of maternal cells in the offspring many years after birth and offspring cells in the mother many years after birth. So the, easy, the easiest test for that is um, where, where it's a male offspring finding cells in the mother that have got Y chromosomes. There's another double X. So, um, so these cells persist for decades, um, and, I think, and in mice, it's even been found two generations down. So grandmothers with cells from grandchildren, <coughs> as well as from their children. So these cells persist for long periods of time. Uh, so it's not it's not the case that the placenta is just a kind of it, it's not the case that the fetus is tolerated just because there's a barrier. Uh, so that's an outdated theory. There's lots of uh, there's lots of immuno action going on. So the conclusion, my conclusion is that if we apply this uh, Credo immunological criteria, we get the conclusion that there's one individual here on the grounds that the fetus is tolerated, or there's mutual toleration. I think it's a more tentative conclusion. Um, one reason you might think it's tentative is, so Prado talks about uh, the fetal immune, he talks about there being, there being parts of the immune system, but so there seem to be kind of implicit claims that either the, there's, a fetal gestator, there's a fetal immune system and a gestator immune system, but they're part of a larger immune system, and the larger immune system, the, the largest immune system we can find is where we should find fix the individual, or it seems there's a not an implicit claim, there's going to have to be an implicit claim that there is no such thing as a fetal immune system or a gestator immune system, and saying that sounds to at least fly in the face of the way in which um, immunologists would talk about fetuses and uh, gestators. They would talk about the fetal immune system and they would talk about the maternal immune system. Of course they might be wrong to talk like that, but it, it's, a, it's a kind of, can, it, it goes, it, it runs counter to the way to kind of biological um, typical usage of these terms. Um, Proto does allow there to be a hierarchy of systems. He talks about, in, um, so he thinks that that work of policing of eggs, that's the kind of thing he thinks is a tight analogy of immune systems. So he thinks that that, that should count as an immune system. Um, but he wants to say where there's a, if there's an immune if but then there are immune systems in the individual ants or bees. But he talks about one level prevailing, he uses the term prevailing over the other, and it's not, it's not immediately clear on what grounds he says that there's always going to be one level which prevails and is, more, is stronger. So I think this is a more tentative conclusion. Um, and there are two more caveats that I'll finish with. Yeah. So one is, uh, you might think, 
if you know a bit about this literature, that uh, the fact that there can be maternal fetal evolutionary conflict makes you think that this immunological stuff might be you might, there might be a kind of manipulation interpretation of what's going on rather than a toleration interpretation. So this is work by people like David Haig, who argue convincingly, based on work by people like Robert Trivers in the 1970s, that the fetus and the gestator don't have fully aligned evolutionary interests. Um, I'm not going to say great about that, but if people ask about that, I think it's interesting we can talk about it. So there's potential for a manipulation interpretation. So for instance, um, I could go all the way back to the all the way back to this. So people do talk about the placenta in invading the maternal cells and the maternal cells um, undergo um, a programmed cell death so, cell, uh, so the, the implantation goes alongside massive cell death on the uterine wall that allows implantation. Um, but on, an, on, a, on a maternal fetal evolutionary conflict understanding, the degree to which there's that invasiveness, uh, the fetus and the, and the gestator are not going to be in agreement about the degree to which there needs to be that invasiveness. So people like Hay think that there's an evolutionary battle of, for more invasiveness on the part of the fetus, but less invasiveness on the part of the mother or the gestator in order for, so one quick way to say, to say what's going on is uh, the gestator want has got an interest in keeping some resources for future offspring, whereas the gestator, the gestator is related to, may be related to future offspring, or it will be related to future offspring of the mother, but it's not going to be as closely related to them as it is to itself, whereas the mother, the gestator, is equally related to all of her offspring, and so wants to make equal, all of the things being equal, wants to make equal investment into all of them. So, um, so there's a, there's, a, there's a manipulation interpretation of some of this stuff that's possible. Uh, and there's also a manipulation, sorry, I'm going to go the wrong way. It's also possible to have an, um, a manipulation, to think that at least some of what's going on here is manipulation of the, the gestation immune system by the fetus. It's got more interest in being tolerated than the, mater, the gestator's interest in tolerating the fetus. As I said, we can talk about more if people have got some questions. But, but, if I'm, if I'm just applying Prudeau's view, he doesn't distinguish tolerance from manipulation. So one of the things he says is long-term tolerated parasites are part of the mouse. So remember the stuff about the, the biome, the, well, the aphids, the bacteria in the aphids that are um, mutualistic and are crucial to each other. The hollow biome of our um, material I, I kept saying parasite at one point, but I didn't mean to. But on Prudeau's view, long-term tolerated, pa tolerated parasites in me or in, the, in a mouse count as part of the immunological individual. So if, if the parasite is evading um, an immunological response, it just gets treated as part of the individual, according to Prudeau. Now, I take that to be kind of counterintuitive. And maybe the case of pregnancy is a kind of halfway step, which is not quite so. so if some of what's going on is manipulation of the gestator immune system, it's, it's perhaps not so counterintuitive to still talk about one immune system and one individual than it is in the parasite case. But, but another possibility is, if you think that that sounds like a strange, if you think there's something wrong with the approach because of that, then pregnancy just seems to give another example where we might think manipulation is going on, and we'll get the wrong answer because of what really is happening is manipulation. So can you just say a little bit about how the manipulation suppression distinction is dialectically working here? So manipulation you were thinking of not so being, so what's the difference on how the Well so okay, so, so say on the on the invasiveness of implantation, the question would be so typically I think people who understood what's going on as being um, signals Cellular chemical signals are coming are in the placenta, or oh, sorry, not in the placenta, um, or on the exterior of the blastocyst at implantation, and they trigger various kinds of programmed cell death. Now, one interpretation is that 
the, the mother, maternal programmed cell death is a trait of the is a trait of the mother in order to allow the fetus to implant. Another interpretation would be a kind of Dork, Richard Dawkins extended phenotype sort of view, which the the, the, the the fetal traits are kind of reaching out into the maternal organism and getting it to do things for the benefit of the fetus. Now, of course, if so, the first is suppression, the second is manipulation. Yeah. So the first would yeah. So the first would yes. Yeah. So and so 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 and when it comes to the immune system, the fetus. Uh, the fetus um, produces various so uh, HLAG uh, cells and regulatory T cells, which allow it to avoid the immunological response, which would normally be found um, against well foreign material. For those things, you shouldn't talk about it. Being, it's not the foreignness that matters, but. Um, Traditionally, people would have talked about foreign material, non-self material being recognised, and regulatory T cells and the HLAG molecules turn down the immune response. Now, of course, they, they, that's turning down. Our own cells, as it were, also do those kinds of things, so our own cells don't provoke a strong immune response, and the fetal cells don't. One view is that that's because, uh, as it were, the, if, if you think the fetus and the mother are have completely aligned interests, well it doesn't matter, there's no room for there being kind of a disagreement. Mm -hmm. But it might be that you think that the production of those molecules is a subversion of the system in the same way that some parasites and uh, pathogens can avoid the immune system and not be rejected because they can, well, they can hide in one way or another. So is, is it hiding from the immune system or is it just part of a, uh, an adaptive response? But, but I take it that, I mean, it's people like Haig, it's people like Haig who want to, I mean, it's an unorthodox approach to talk about manipulation. But Haig thinks that normally people have just had this view that the mother and the offspring are, have got completely aligned interests, in which case what you expect is that the, you expect, um, it's, it's not surprising that there's lack of immune response. That the fetus isn't rejected. Why would it be rejected? Because it's in the maternal organism's interest and in the fetus's interest not to be rejected. So there's a there's a there's always been a mystery about how it was how it came to be that it wasn't rejected. Rather, what, what the mechanism? So people didn't know what the mechanism for non-rejection was fifty years ago, say hundred years ago. Um, but it was completely obvious why fetuses weren't rejected. But on the on Hague's view, it's not completely obvious. I mean, of course, they sometimes are rejected. So typically, so, so lots of um, early, very early miscarriages on Haig's kind of view is going to be rejection because the, it's, in, it's in a maternal organism an interest to reject that fetus and save resources for another fetus rather than to continue the pregnancy. But it's in the, it may well be in the, you know, the fetus's interests aren't going to be the same. I don't know if that answers the word, what the difference is going to be. It's going to be very difficult. I think. I think what probably is going to be difficult to tell. Okay, but I, 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 so, so, so that's that bit. Those two you answered. And the second bit was, how does it affect the dynamic of one individual or two? Well, uh, two, 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 two well just, just because. I mean, I. To me, it seems. I mean. To me, it seems counterintuitive that you want to say that the parasites are part of the mouse. Right. Because it seems. It seems that if. if on the basis that they're not rejected by the mouse. So the, the fact that the mouse's cells aren't attacking some parasites, my intuition is that, that something seems to have gone wrong. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, on that yeah, basis, yeah. it's part of it. And I, to, I mean, Prado, so this, the book's 2011, but he gave a talk over at LSE that I went to last year, and he, re, and he sort of reiterated this position. So he wants to stick to this position that I take to be, I take it to be counterintuitive that the parasite is uh, right. Well, so, 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 if it's manipulation, we're obliged to say it's the, the yeah, there's, there's some yeah yes yeah yeah. If it's suppression, yes. there might be. Well, if it's if it's if it's if I'm so, Sorry, if, no 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 because I think I think it's difficult. I think I mean I'm not sure and I'm not sure what I think about this. So like I say, I don't. I don't know whether that means this means that pregnancy is an extra reason to think that Prodosi is wrong. Um, or it's an interesting application and we should accept it. But the, so the argument's going to be, 
Um, yeah, well, my so cells, so my cells are not. So my cells interact with my, with the okay. immune system. Yeah. It's not. It's not passive. Yeah. It's not. They just sit there. They're interacting. All of my cells are constantly interacting with these immune, um, various immune system molecules. Right. They're not rejected. And, and, and for those of you, is that that's because we've got one organism. So we've got one organism where we've got non-rejection, right. and and the non and, and it's. But if you think that what's going on is that that, that I'm evading the immune system, that seems to push me to think. You know, there's something doing the evading. There's like a, there's a different organism. There's a different organism that's doing the evading. To talk about it evading it. Right. Um, I, I mean, like I said, like, there'd be analogies, wouldn't there, with kind of pro-social and anti-social behaviour? Like, I'm not part, I'm not part of the... If I'm hiding and cheating, I'm not part of the team. If I'm, if I'm not, you know, if I'm not thrown out of the team because I'm just hiding the fact that I'm cheating, that doesn't mean I'm part of the team, whereas if I'm kept in the team because I'm, I'm recognised as being a kind of valid member, then I am part of the team. But on, okay, but on the plateau of view, sorry, I'm just no, no. That's a word, the, the dialectical, dialectically, dialectically significant difference between tolerance on one hand and manipulation or suppression on the other. Well, well so for Proudhon, there is no difference. Okay. So for Proudhon, but, 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 Proudhon is not worried about this. Right, okay. I mean, he isn't, that's right. But, but he's you, not worried about this. But you might. I'm a bit worried about I'm quite worried about but it. But manipulation and suppression are in the same <coughs> box, even if there's slightly different mechanisms. Well, they. That's why I think it's not. So okay, so there, there. So there, I need to, I need to know more detail about the immunology. Oh, face of it. But in, in in principle, you could imagine yeah. that the, the same the same chemical, you know, the same chemical flags, as it were, are being waved. But you know, but is is it is it a counterfeit? Is it a counterfeit uh, regulatory T cell, or is it a genuine regulatory T cell? Yes. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it might actually be, you know, there might be the same chemical messenger. If I, if so, there will be there be other. Yeah. So. Right. So, so what we're talking, so what we're saying here is that in one way view, what's going on is it's not simply that the gestator tolerates the fetus. And all vice versa. But there's something sophisticated, a bit more sophisticated going on, which we can call manipulation or suppression, or yeah. some combination, which suggests, as it were, there are two things interacting in a way that doesn't work. They're disposed to reject one another. Yeah, but, but something is going on to make sure that the fetus is able that, 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 that disposition is. The fetus is able to do things right. which, but I, I realise actually, okay, so that is, that's, that may be a poor title, so maybe I really just want to say tolerance or manipulation. Both tolerance and manipulation are due to suppression, so things like regulatory T cells suppress immune responses. So yeah, I think there's a, yeah, I think there's a problem probably with me using suppression there as being, I'm, I'm not saying manipulation and suppression are synonymous or something like that. It's meant, what I should really have there is uh, tolerance suppression, or is it manipulative suppression? But notice that the manipulation is by the per by the entity which is being, uh, which is not the entity that's doing the suppressing, as it were. It's the just it's the gestator immune system that's doing this has re suppressed responses. Yeah. Okay. This is helpful because I think that means that it's, it's probably not very helpful that I put that up there. But so, let's get to a So, if I, if I were to take some fetal blood and inject that straight into the maternal system, you know, um, yeah. there would, so would there be immune reaction there? <coughs> so, so I don't know the answer to that because I do, but, I, but the, even in the haemochorial placentas, the maternal blood and fetal blood don't actually mix. 
So yeah, so that that kind of yes. so that that kind of so that that would be a, that, that's an experiment rather than a kind of an example of what actually happens. Yeah, so you'd be able to right. do that, and you could do something different. So there's so we know we know from microchimerism that cells. So there are so there are fetal cells in maternal blood. That's where they're found often. So fetal cells will be found in the maternal circulation, um, and they're not and they're tolerated and they're there for decades. Right. So right. so so that's so they accept actually. Now I'm going to kind of contradict myself and say, so that's not an experiment with injecting them, that's just they're found and they're tolerated. Um, I mean, no, they, no so. I mean, there is an immune response if you, if the fetal blood crosses into the maternal blood. In fact, there is a condition called erythroblastosis fetalis, I think, where if the mother is Rh positive and the fetus is Rh negative, then in the first pregnancy, the, there will be antigens against the Rh factor yeah. in the mother, and in the second pregnancy, because there is interchange of blood between the fetus and the mother, um, the mother won't, uh, the fetus will not survive because those antigens will cross over and kill the fetus, and there's an immune response between them. So, um, yes, that's the yeah, that's for the basis yeah. factor. So, uh, so. So I think this is this kind of emphasizes that I think it's not it's, it's a more tentative conclusion. Yeah. So I think that the evolutionary conclusion is fairly clear cut, but I'm not so clear about the conclusion. But that's, but, um, but as I said, I take that partly to be that I'm not quite sure what Prado. It's not completely clear to me what counts as an immune system. <coughs> Because, for instance, it can't be that he's demanding that there's some token molecule which kind of fuses the meanders around the whole organism, because that won't be what's happening. Or even there won't even be a type, particular type of molecule that goes, it's going to have to be some kind of chain or just patchwork of molecules acting in different places. So, I, so yeah, so I think it's, so I think there's various reasons to think that the technical is more tentative. And I'll just I'll just move I'll finish. Sorry, sorry, sorry. No, 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 that's really helpful. That's really helpful. <coughs> In as much as I think it's more I think it's difficult, I think it's more difficult to, to I think it's difficult to apply the Perot case here. I think having talked to Perot very quickly, he thinks it's fairly straightforward. I think he, he thinks that the treatment maternal fetal relationship is the one is my conclusion as it were. I think I've got, I've got more concerns about whether or not it's the right conclusion of applying his theory than, than he has. In passing, he would say, oh yeah, yeah, okay, pregnancy is really interesting, that's going to be another example. Of? Another example of, a, of, a, of a, the, the, the immune individual being the gestator oh, fetus. Did you want to say something now? I mean, maybe you need to try to Yeah, should I just, because the other, the, the other response you might have is to say that um, that the, the, the fetus is tolerated, but it's not playing any kind of functional role. It's not at the heart or something like that. Um, first of all, that might not be true. So that the, 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 the sort of meta literature survey by Bodhi um, that I had a quote from earlier, um, there are various suggestions that uh, the fetal microchimerism is actually playing a role in the maternal physiology uh, during pregnancy and afterwards. That it plays a role in either um, increasing or decreasing the risk of various diseases. So it might not be true that, it, that, that, that the fetus isn't, that doesn't have a kind of functional role to play in the viability of the maternal organism or the gestator. Um, but again, Prudhoe takes what it takes to be a relatively counterintuitive view. So he says at one point, um, if one adopts the immunological perspective, then the physiological individual admits among his constituents the microbes with which its immune system interacts and it tolerates, regardless of their functional contrib contribution. So notice the holobiont theory, typically it's taken to be that if there's such a thing as, uh, as a holobiont, it's us and the mutualistic bacteria that we rely on that play a functional role in various systems. Whereas for Prudhoe, just you know, anything, I mean, notice this is related to the previous point, anything, it doesn't have to have a functional role, if it's tolerated, it's just part of the organism. But in any case, I don't think it's right that the fetus isn't playing a functional role because it, it's playing a functional role in the gestators, what, what, what the evolutionary biologists would call life history strategy. 
is part of the, it's contributing to fecundity, it's not contributing to viability. Being pregnant reduces your viability as a gestator, as a gestator, but it's contributing to fecundity. And of course, fitness is, fitness is a function of fecundity and viability. So it is playing a function of in the life history strategy. <coughs> so to just finish, um, so I think that the, so I, I, I so I tried, I tried to convince you that there's this problem of what the right way to think of biological individuals is, that there are these weird cases like Aspen and so on. Um, but people like Clark have come up with evolutionary answers to what it is to be a biological individual. And I'm, I'm claiming that in the case of pregnancy, we should think that there are two biological individuals. But for those of the logical answer, I'm suggesting gives the answer one. And so we've got a problem in virtuality much closer to home, so to speak, because normally it's slime molds, or it's um, siphonophore Portuguese man of war, or uh, dandy lions, or oak trees, and so on. But this is much closer to home than those kinds of, well, to say they're exotic, well, they're, they're distantly related to us, uh, to us, but one of the things people have emphasized is you know, there's a lot of plant material out there, so <laughs> this biological individuality question is a kind of pressing one, just because just mammals have been seen to be unproblematic in the past. Um, having said that, remember, there's all this literature gradually on whether or not we should be taken with, along with our gut flora to be individuals. But I take it that we, we could have spotted the existence of pregnancy without even having invented the microscope. So I'll stop there. <laughs> That's some references. <coughs> Is it possible to have a drink? No. I mean, yes.
to the extent that then, to the extent that then, so I, I don't know that, that, that particular case whether or not that individual was, I mean, it was, it was obviously a viable, they were, you know, they, it was an adult, the photo was an adult, an adult's back with these kind of various patterns from different skin coloration. Um, so I take it that they were, were viable and fertile, and so to the extent that they were going to have a lineage, they were going to be, I think, hey, what, wanting to say that there were going to be two lineages and that, that, was, that there were two evolutionary individuals because I think he was close, he, he's, so I, th I think, I think it's, I think I'm quoting him saying, so I think he's happy to say that identical twins are, is, are one evolutionary individual. But I mean, I, mean, I, that, I take that, that, that's controversial I think because of, um, Genetic inheritance, so the way in which it's you know, the vertical transmission of traits that don't go through the genes. But he, I think he, yeah, I think he said that in talk. He, he was happy to say that the identical twins were one evolutionary individual. And so I think that the chimeras were two individuals. And then, so, and then related to that, I think, so they, and then, so it's not, I mean, those microchimeras, it's not obvious what, what, what we should even say about those, because I could have, so one thing to say about them might be, okay, they're, I think I said, they're fetal, they're fetal derived cells. They can derive, they're, they're, the origin of the cells was in, was in the mother. But like on, on Prado's kind of view, those those cell those microchimeral cells are just going to count as part of the mother who's no longer pregnant, or the grandmother if they're in the grandmother. So on, so for Prado, it doesn't matter where the cells are derived from. All that matters is what's tolerated. So so on his view, that, those microchimeral cases are just yeah they're just cells like they well not necessarily they're not cells like any other, but they're. They're just cells that are in that, that are in that bit of biological material, and they're being if they're being tolerated, then they're just they are cells in that individual. The, the, it's not it doesn't clinch the question of like whose they are. That's not clinched by where they came from originally or something like that. But of course, the, the, the people like Hay and that. Study that I was, the, the, which one? No, this one. Okay, so, this is fetal microchimerism and maternal health. Well, from an evolutionary perspective, of course, and from a fetal maternal evolution conflict perspective, the, the thinking is that it may be that some of these, these microchimeras might be having effects, they might have functional effects in maternal organisms, some of which may be protective because the fetus and the Offspring that the, the mother have got relatively aligned evolutionary interests, but some of them, some of the effects of the microchimeral cells may be ones which are pathological in the maternal organism. They may they may have negative effects, or there's the interest in whether or not they, the cells from a first child can get into a second child. That's interesting because the siblings are going to have not have completely convergent interests. So there's going to be room for the for those cells to be having effects which might be detrimental to the viability of siblings. And of course that that, that, that that shows up the kind of that shows up the way in which the if you look Prodose, what Prodo says is going to be very kind of different to what the evolutionary approach is going to say. I think I don't know if that's part of the answer, at least part of the answer. Uh, yeah I was talking about like so about autoimmune responses to um, cancer cells and, I, and he, he wants to go down the line of saying yeah they're not 
they're not part of the world. Whereas on the evolutionary approach, they're all, I mean, there's something, something's happening in the cancer cells, but they can't get out, apart from the Tasmanian devil kinds of cases, they can't kind of get out of you, as it were, in the next, into the next generation. And so um, they're just all counted, they're just all going to be counted as your cells. But, but he, yeah, he wants to say that the, if, you, if it's a cancer, if it's cancer cells that are being attacked, then they're not, then he says they're not part of the, the right, okay, so then, they're not, they're not part of you in the sense of they're not bits of biological material which are part of this biological individual, which is you. There might be another sense of, there might be another part of sense. I mean, they're part of you in some kind of just topological sense, but they're not, they're not uh, part of the biological individual. Does that make sense? That's what I mean by saying that. Um, it's quite difficult. That's what that what I just said there was a reason for wanting to kind of not talk about parts and wholes more generally and just to talk about the biological individual question. But yeah, he was saying it's not part of me. So I then have a just to follow up like I think on them. Um, so I was wondering like obviously like the immune response is something that can be medically altered, right? Oh right. So like, you know, let's say so if you let's say if my immune system is attacking something. And I go on immunoprocess and it's no longer attacking the part of my body. Yeah. Of my body again. I don't, yeah, okay, I don't know. Yeah, that's okay. So. I don't know. I mean, my guess, my guess is that it, it's going to be, given what he says about parasites, mm -hmm. and given what he says about it doesn't matter whether they've got a vaguely functional role. I think, I think you think from a from an immunophysiological point of view, um, if you're tolerating it, it's part of the physiological individual. And if the, and, and if the reason for the tolerance is that sort of yeah, we, you're being treated with drugs, whereas if you weren't, then you wouldn't be tolerating it. I guess I think you would say well, it just all that matters is whether you're tolerating it or not. Yeah. Well, that, that might be right, but I think I think it is. I mean, I think it is a kind of revision, okay. sort of sort of radical. I think things like the claim about parasites are quite radical. Mm -hmm. yeah. When someone pressed him on it last year, I was sort of well, I was kind of surprised that he yeah he didn't kind of give any ground. He said no, no, that's that's, that's the position. So uh, yeah, so I take it that then those are, that, yeah that, that that might be another kind of counterintuitive case. Uh, I think we come to the end of your time, so you probably need to plan to go. <laughs> but thanks very much for for for, for coming. If we want to continue for a few more minutes, we can do so then perhaps you know, get some <coughs> excuse me uh, to to drink more we'll for a few moments. So. So thanks for your question. questions. Well. Um, I'll do a few things. Yeah. Oh, I have a very general question. It's just a, uh, why do we need sort of uh, this unified or uh, one definition that would apply for every situation? When do we what, what, what need? need? Why can't we just be pluralist? Yeah, yeah, so let's. Like, that uh, we have these different definitions. I mean, what kind of explanatory role plays in a one definition that applies to every case? Yeah, so, so I, I, I think that the I think the kind of majority view is that there, there can just be various that, that these aren't competing definitions. Okay. So yeah, so yeah, so I couldn't be more clear about that can I from the beginning and say so when I said that I was just interested in applying the these different accounts to the case of pregnancy. One of the things I meant by that was, I, yeah, I'm not trying to adjudicate about which one, it, like, have some sort of monist view that from applying it to pregnancy, we should conclude that we must go for an evolutionary approach. Um, of course, I mean, so what I take the case of pregnancy, well, okay, so if the, if the conclusions, if those conclusions are convincing, it means that pregnancy is another example of a case where the two, where different accounts give different answers. Because, of course, 
various different accounts are going to give the same answer in an awful lot of cases. Um, so pregnancy is a kind of interesting. So non non pregnant individuals, I take it that the immune, apart from some of these counterintuitive issues, but it's kind of broadly speaking, is picking out the same things. Um, so uh, so I think most people are pluralists about it. So they would say just. It depends if, if we're um, to, an, to an evolutionary biologist, what matters is that the, the counting the counting question is about keeping track of frequencies and populations in a way that means you can make predictions about frequencies of traits in future generations. And so Clark, I mean Clark tends to be fairly sort of modest. I mean she she just emphasises the evolutionary approach. But I don't think really the fact that she kind of okay that's her definition of a biological individual. But if she's pressed, I think she won't deny that there's some there might be some other interesting useful notions of biological individuality. Um, and I've noticed there are other there are even more notions of individuality than I've been talking about. So philosophers of biology will talk about uh, debates about whether species are biological individuals rather than types. But that, and that's another sense of take that to be another sense of biological individuality. It's one of the reasons why Prodeau doesn't like to talk. He prefers to just talk about organisms. Um, but yes, so, so evolutionary biologists' interests are different from obstetricians. I mean, I, I, yeah, so I take it that, well, um, I talked to uh, the Women in Philosophy conference that we had in Southampton, and I was talking about the evolutionary approach to some of the women philosophers, feminist philosophers, and their response was, yes, yeah, so they were, they, they were, I think they were happy with pluralism, but their response was like, why, why would any pregnant woman be interested in the evolutionary approach? Like, if you're the pregnant woman, like, what, like in that situation, what you care about, like, your, your interests are physiological interests. Because um, on, the, on the evolutionary approach, like, the placenta is basically kind of invisible on the evolutionary approach. The, the evolutionary approach is, is atemporal, because what matters is lifetime fitness effects. So, it, the idea, it, 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 kind of, it doesn't matter, there could be any kind of placenta, you could bud off in any way. What matters is the kind of keeping track of those things that have gone through bottlenecks, if you think Clark's, well, have gone through sufficiently good policing mechanisms, if you think Clark's right, or have gone through bottlenecks and germ soma separation, sequestration, and um, yeah, the way in which pregnancy happens doesn't really matter because it's what matters is lifetime effects, and pregnancy is just. A, so I don't understand from what the feminist philosophers response. Well, I think she, well, was that incorrect? Well, but because I think I, I commented that well, I, I made the kind of comment that I just made about the fact that the kind of the, the biology of pregnancy is kind of invisible to an evolutionary to an evolutionary approach. I mean, we we could. We could have one of those placentas that's much less invasive, for instance, or we could, or, or we could, you know, we could be reproducing in all sorts of, in, could be budding off, as it were, wow. and the kind of the calculus, what the evolutionist, bio, the evolutionary biologist wants to track, is going to be lifetime fitness effects, right. and the way in which budding happens yeah. is not, it's not obvious why, what relevance that has, and so when I said something along the lines of, okay, the kind of Biology of pregnancy and the placenta is going to be kind of invisible to the evolutionary approach. Her response was, "Well, okay, well, so why would anybody? Why, why, why would why would someone who's pregnant be interested in looking at that?" It's like all the questions. Yeah. Well, it's just when someone's pregnant, the question is, oh, well, it doesn't matter what they want to get you along to. Um, yes, but, but I, I, yeah, so I, I take um, it that I, I, I take mean, for other kids, if you're pregnant, well, you're probably not interested in evolution, but you're interested in other aspects of biology. Yeah, but that's so, not to say that uh, those answer the question whether there's one individual. Oh, so, uh, yes, yeah, so they weren't. So they weren't saying that the question of how many individuals they were wasn't interesting. What they were saying was like they they were, they were saying, I think, oh, that the the physiological definitions of an organism sound much more kind of close to what my interests are. As Women's experiences of being pregnant right. are tied to physiology. They're not tied 
they're not tied to evolutionary considerations. Sure, well, people who've written about um, people who've written about phenomenology of pregnancy right, right, right. Are, are talking about physiology. Although, yeah, of course, yeah, right. but having said that, having said that, I think that the, the, the biology, the evolutionary considerations are interesting because yeah, that, the maternal fetal evolutionary conflict yeah. is really interesting in the way that it plays out in maternal fetal more proximate conflict yeah, yeah. in various ways. So, my my. My partner's first pregnancy, she had uh, she had bad preeclampsia, so, so which which can be lethal to the well, it can be lethal to the gestator, and, and then it can also be lethal to the offspring. Yeah. But on Hayes, I think Hay thinks it's he thinks it's just it it is it's a theory from his kind of side of evolutionary biology, but his view is that. Um, his view is that, uh, what's the term there? His view is that that condition is, um, is an expression of fetal demands. It's, it's a conflict where the fetus, in, in situations where there's low oxygen levels, it will make demands on the, maternal, on the mother in ways which are, you know, there's a balance between killing the mother, killing, killing the person that's gestator where it's not yet given birth but um, but demanding enough to make sure that it survives so um, so he thinks that preeclampsia is an expression it's approximate expression of the evolution conflict and I take it that I take it that pregnant woman like, would or should I don't know about should but then that is that thing is that is interesting because that is physiology you know some of the, some of the physiology is approximate it's approximate Manifestation of the evolution of conflict on people on hate on people who emphasise maternal fetal conflict. And I think you know, Hay, I think critics think that the maternal fetal conflict literature is kind of overstating its case, and the maternal fetal conflict people like Hay think they're just trying to kind of give a kind of corrective to a rosy view where the mother spring have got perfectly aligned interests they're not they'll say we're not saying that fetus and um, gestator are in a situation of extreme conflict and it's not a zero-sum game or something like that yeah uh, so, so can i have a small follow-up i was just thinking all the time that maybe maybe um, for 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 the individual the, the mother but also for the society at large uh, perhaps i mean the ethical questions something that would be implied by the different theories of uh, biological individuality, individuality right? Yeah, so, like abortion, um, yeah so, so the Bump Project, so that's Elaine's Bump Project, so the kind of, the, the main focus is on just, just, it's on doing a mixture of philosophy of biology, philosophy of biology and more traditional metaphysics uh, and applying it to the case of pregnancy with a view to that having impact on sort of wider social, political mm -hmm. or philosophical discussions that relate to pregnancy. So of course including things like abortion but, but the project, the project, so there isn't an ethics person in the project as it were, that wasn't one of job specifications kind of. Uh, but I think else the would be to, you know, the, the idea is to feed into those debates in a way that's informed by the actual biology. But it's, I, but I, I, but I take that to be a kind of a good thing about the project, that it's not at all obvious. It's not obvious to me what effect your, so Elsa is interested in thinking about, talking about whether or not the fetus is a part of the gestator, or maybe is it that the fetus is part of the gestator, or is it that the gestator and the fetus are both part of some larger thing? And then we kind of struggle with terminology for that. She's been calling it a grammar um, uh, recently. Um, but it's whether you think that there's that part whole relationship or it's a containment relationship, it's not immediately obvious what, I mean, I, I don't know what the kind of ethical consequences of that are. I mean, it's because, I mean, 
an immediate thought is that having autonomy over parts of you is a kind of that's something one would think about when it came to like, donating kidneys and so on. So I have I, I have I, sh I should and I do and should have control over parts of my body. But um, it also get I know that some of the other people working on the project are interested in things like surrogacy arrangements and what thinking about these kinds of issues mean for surrogacy arrangements and uh, where the kind of natural maternal rights lie. But it's not obvious. I mean, Haig comments, I've heard that, yeah, he commented that when he talks about maternal fears or conflict, he gets attacked when he, when he publishes um, um, in kind of popular, popular science or in kind of public kind of journals and so on in the newspapers. He gets attacked by, he gets attacked both by pro-life in the States, he gets attacked by pro-life people and pro-choice people, both attack him for taking it that his position on maternal fetal conflict says something really clearly either in favour or against one of those positions. Um, so I take that to show that it doesn't, <laughs> the maternal fetal conflict literature doesn't immediately speak to like pro-life or pro-choice position, even that people can, he said I get into enormous trouble from both sides. <laughs> Yeah, so I think that, yeah, we're interested in we're interested in ethical in the ethical kind of arguments, I think, but not not immediately. Like I said, so some of my colleagues they're interested in surrogacy. That's where I think yeah. So there's nobody working on what these kinds of things mean for abortion rights. But one of the PhD students, she's writing papers or chapters on surrogacy and how many, how many parents are there. Donated sperm. If I donate, if two parents donate sperm and eggs, but they're gestated in a third individual. Are there three parents, two parents? And of course, some of these considerations tend to point towards there being three parents, mm. a kind of a gestational parent, rather than a mere container. So yeah, so we're interested in those kinds of things, or some of us are. I think probably ought to. Into the close. <coughs> um, so we're going to go get some food. Anybody is welcome to come along. Um, does that you? Uh, where? Well, that's the next question. <laughs> but thank you, thank you for the other side of the session. <laughs> thank you for the, yeah, thanks for all these questions. There. Um, yeah, they're good. Good questions. Thank, 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 thank you. Thank you. Thank you.